In today's video, we're gonna go over the diagnosis of multi-direction instability. So folks that have multi-directional instability tend to have a lot of laxity or looseness within the shoulder joint. This also has to be by definition, at least three different directions. Let's say posterior, anterior, inferior. Now remember, just because someone is lax doesn't mean that they're instable or unstable. Someone also had to be complaining of subluxation or dislocation events. If they just have a lot of range of motion, a lot of laxity doesn't necessarily mean they're unstable, it just means that they're very lax. Now this condition is largely thought to be congenital or basically people are just born with a lot of laxity, which may lead to some instability. However, some authors theorize that given sports expose the joint to a lot of end ranges of motion and can cause multi-direction instability. Think about a sport like swimming where you have to go to end ranges in multiple positions. Maybe because of that, you start to adopt laxity in different directions like you would for an acquired anterior instability or posterior instability. Multi-direction instability is most common in folks from the age of 10 to 35, but keep in mind this can happen at any age. So again, by definition, you need to have instability in three different directions and not just laxity. However, what you might find is some folks have a predominant instability. So they feel very unstable anteriorly and posteriorly, it's only a little bit of instability, right? Oftentimes these folks are going to present with concomitant pathology. The thought is, is if I have a lot of motion within the joint and my shoulder blade maybe isn't moving the way it should, more on this later, I may end up with rotator cuff related pain, bicipital tendinopathy, or other injuries, other things to irritate it because of all the laxity and instability within the joint. The thing to keep in mind is that folks have multi-direction instability, usually have a tremendous amount of range of motion at their shoulder. Just keep in mind, just because you have a lot of motion doesn't always mean you have instability. What's pretty neat about multi-direction instability is because they have so much laxity within the capsule, when they go overhead, they actually don't get a lot of movement from the scapula, and they actually tend to sit into a little bit of downward rotation. So <clears throat> we have Sean here in the back, and I just wanna try to point out where his shoulder blades are. So Sean here doesn't have multi-direction instability, has normal motion at the shoulder blade. I apologize, I couldn't find someone with this condition. But anyway, let's bring your arms fully overhead for me. And what normally happens with overhead elevation is you get about 60 degrees of motion from the shoulder blade, and then the rest is gonna come from the shoulder joint. If you're having a tough time seeing that, shoulder blade is about here now, right? And let's go all the way back down again. Yep, and you can see the medial border of the shoulder blade should be more or less vertical. Now, in folks that have multi-direction instability, they actually tend to sit in a little bit of downward rotation, okay? So when you look from behind, you're not gonna see a vertical, you're actually gonna see a little bit of downward rotation. Now, the other piece, go ahead and go fully overhead for me, Sean, is that when they upwardly rotate, they don't upwardly rotate very much. And the thought is they have so much motion coming from the shoulder joint, from all the laxity, the shoulder blade doesn't move very much. Come back down again. So if you watch a few repetitions, right, it'll sit here and go to about here and back down again. Now, normal shoulder blade motion is what Sean has. You can see he's getting a lot of upward rotation like a normal person does. Well, for MDI, you're gonna notice more downward rotation and less upward rotation. To go along with the video today, I have a little gift for you. It's an evidence-based cheat sheet for shoulder instability. It's a four page PDF that goes over everything you need to know about shoulder instability. We go over prevalence, anatomy, joint, arthrokinematics, risk factors, and different types of instability, causes of instability, whether or not your patient should undergo surgery or have conservative care like physical therapy, and finally rehab implications for all the different types of instability. So if you're looking to get up to speed about shoulder instability in less than 10 minutes, then this PDF is for you. I'll leave a link in the show notes in the description. Go ahead and click on that and then download it and then get back to what you're learning about right now. So classically, folks with multi-directional instability, again, they have instability in multiple directions. So you can use any of the special tests in any of my instability videos. I have a video for anterior instability, I have a video for posterior instability, and I'll leave those links in the description. For today's video, I wanted to go over a study by Watson in 2022, and he had a criteria for diagnosing multi, uh, excuse me, multi-direction instability. The first of which the patients had to have some sort of subluxation or dislocation event. 
The second piece that they needed to have a positive sulcus sign, which we'll go over in a minute. And after that, they had three additional special tests for anterior and posterior instability. And two out of three had to be, a po had to be positive, both in the anterior direction and the posterior direction. So largely you're assessing for sulcus sign, instability anteriorly and posteriorly. Inferior sulcus sign, so have your patient seated, relaxing their arm fully at your side. What I'm gonna do is visualize the scapula as it comes to the acromion, and then basically, as you dip off the acromion, you come into the humeral head right here. I'm gonna take my hand, I'm gonna pull the arm down, and for someone who has a positive sulcus sign, you'll notice a space that opens up right here, right? This would be a positive sulcus sign. Another great way to stabilize the glenohumeral joint is really just going to Fitness Pain Free, hitting the subscribe button. You're listening to the video right now, you probably wanna like it too. Make that shoulder joint nice and stable, right? Anterior and posterior drawer test in 20 degrees of abduction. I abduct to 20 degrees with my opposite side hand. I'm feeling for the humeral head. So if I poke around, find the scapula, I come off of that. That's where the humeral head is. I pinch it just like so. From here, I'm going to apply an anterior force, and I'm also gonna to try to apply a posterior force. A positive special test is going to be apprehension and not just lax. Anterior and posterior drawer test at 100 degrees of abduction. So I'm gonna abduct to 100. From here, I'm gonna grasp the humeral head like so, and I can draw either anteriorly up like this or posteriorly down towards the floor. A positive special test would be apprehension and not pain. Anterior apprehension test, I'm gonna take patient's arm, abduct to 90, maximally externally rotate. A positive special test would be apprehension. For posterior instability testing, we're going to abduct to 90. I'm going to apply an axial load, so pushing to the elbow. From here, I adduct and internally rotate. A positive special test, again, will be apprehension. So I wanna go over this criteria by Watson again, because I thought it was a little bit confusing. So essentially we need to have some sort of subluxation or dislocation event. The second piece, you need to have a positive inferior sulcus sign. And then we need two out of three tests positive, both anterior and posterior. And that's going to be the drawer test at 20 degrees, drawer test at 100, anterior and posterior, as well as the anterior instability test and the posterior instability test. So now you're an all-star diagnosing multi-direction instability, you still need to know how to diagnose the most common form of instability, which is anterior instability. Well, I have got the video for you. I'll leave a link in the corner. Go ahead and click on that, and we'll be going over diagnosis of anterior instability. I'll see you there.